Hello all. Hopefully you're hearing me fine. Uh, if you don't hear me, I'm hoping that you're typing into the chat box to let me know that there are any audio issues. As we go along, if you have any problems, if uh, my audio is going out or if there are any issues, please just type them into the chat box. I'll be glancing down every now and again just to make sure I'm seeing everything. If you have any questions, that's the place to go as well. Uh, you can type any of your questions in there. Uh, or raise your hand if I'm not catching your question fast enough. And I'll, uh, you can raise your hand by clicking on the icon at the top of the, uh, of the browser window as a little icon with a person raising their hand. Uh, and that will send me a little notification and tell me that you have a question. Uh, otherwise, just type it in the chat box and we'll go along. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, you're going to hear this from me again and again and again uh, as we go along for the next couple weeks. Um, we could not do this process without you. Uh, this the Research Initiation Grant Program, which we'll talk about in a second, some of the details, but this Research Initiation Grant Program has grown significantly here at the University at Penn State uh, and has helped to fund a number of great innovative projects, some of which have gone on in simply the three years we've been running this, project, this uh, grant program, have gone on to some great things, uh, development of new platforms and tools, uh, moving on to larger multi-million dollar grants, uh, it's been a, an excellent, rewarding process, and we could not do any of it if it were not for our reviewer com uh, community. Uh, you bring your time to the table. Uh, you give us your dedication. You give us your thoughts and your mind and your expertise, and not just for COIL for making these decisions, but also to all the proposers that send in their proposals each time. Uh, in our first round, we had five or six proposals that came in. Uh, we quickly moved that up to 10, 15 proposals. This round, uh, which our fall round is usually our, our smaller round uh, with fewer submissions, uh, but as of 5 o'clock yesterday, we had 30 submissions uh, come in. So we had uh, an, an X community and a, a great representation of individuals, students, staff, faculty, undergraduates, graduate students uh, from many of our Commonwealth campuses, great partnerships with other universities and other organizations, uh, just, a, just an excellent turnout all around. So I'm really excited about this process, and we have 30 great proposals to read through. Uh, so what we're going to do today uh, in, in what's probably going to be an hour uh, would be my guess. That's usually what it ends up taking. But in this hour, what I'm going to do is basically tell you how to do the reviews. And I mentioned in some of the chat that I was typing in before we got started that we, we try to make this as easy as possible for you. And uh, we have refined this process to the point that uh, we've got a lot of feedback that it really does help you through step by step. But what we can do in this our webinar is just actually walk you through. So you see the documents, you see the things, you see me do a review, uh, and that way you're comfortable uh, when you go in to submit your, your responses. Uh, but let's backtrack a little bit, and for those of you who have not met me or do not know me, my name is Brad Zdenek. Uh, I am the Innovation Strategist here at the Center for Online Innovation and Learning, COIL, and uh, in addition to uh, uh, directing a lot of our innovation work, I also direct the COIL Research Initiation Grant process, uh, and that means helping work with uh, you reviewers, helping to work with the proposers and the principal investigators on projects that are sent in as well as working with them after the grants have been awarded. Uh, we've had a, uh, a, some changes in the process uh, this time around. If you've been with us before, uh, you may be familiar with uh, a, a few different rules and requirements, criteria for the, for the rig process, and I'll get to those changes as we, as we go along today. Uh, again, all of them are, are spelled out in the documents that I, that I provide to you. Um, so that's who I am. What is the RIG process? Uh, some of you are very familiar. Uh, I see a lot of you have joined, so I don't know who all is on today, but, uh, but some of you have been on research initiation grants that we have funded in the past, so you may be familiar. But for those of you who are not, uh, the research initiation grant process is an initiative that uh, COIL heads to try to provide some seed funding for new and innovative ideas, tools, techniques, pedagogies, approaches, uh, uh, it, it's, it's our opportunity to provide a little bit of seed funding to get that idea that is sitting latent in, 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 the, in the individuals that are sitting across this university. These ideas are just sitting there and help them come to fruition, help them actually be realized. 
Uh, one of the most frustrating things I could ever experience is when I hear about someone who has a great idea but doesn't act on it because they don't know how or they don't have the resources to do so. So what the rigs do is they try to bring that capacity to those ideas and help them to, to grow into something. They fund a project for a course of a year, uh, actually 18 months. Uh, the funding is available for 18 months, but the project runs over a course of a year. And after that year, the idea is that these projects then move on to larger funding sources or other support units here at the university or to something larger like a Gates grant or an NSF grant or an IES grant, uh, all three of which some of our rig proposals ha or rig projects have moved on to. So that's the idea. We're the starting point. We're, we're trying to, f to feed or to water that seed and, and to get it to some place where it can go on to that larger funding. Uh, but these grants are meant to be laser focused on a few things. Number one, on innovations. And we're going to get to the de definition of an innovation in a few minutes uh, because that's something that we have struggled with and our reviewers have often struggled with. So what I will try to do is give you as much detail on that as I possibly can, as much guidance on that as I possibly can. The trick with innovation is it's difficult to define uh, because you don't want to box thin too much in that definition. So we try to keep it as broad as we can while still giving you direction. So our grants are laser focused on innovations that impact learning. Uh, and that's the other element of this. And you'll see that in proposals that you read, we actually have the, the proposers tease out uh, those two sections in particular. How is this an innovation? And how does it impact learning? And you'll also notice in the criteria we go over in a few minutes that those are the two of the highest uh, point value sections uh, in your review. Uh, because we really want to change higher education. We want to change learning for the better. Uh, and that's what these rigs are intended to do. So what would or how we will do this is we will, uh, I will essentially walk you through the process as though I were a reviewer sitting down ready to do my first review. I was one of you sitting down ready to do this. And hopefully in that, that will illustrate everything that you need to do and answer any questions you have. Um, before that, though, uh, this, I will let you know that this whole process starts with a few emails that we'll be receiving tomorrow morning, uh, possibly very late in the day today, uh, around 5 o'clock. Uh, and that, those emails will provide you with some narrative of these instructions that I'm giving you right now, uh, as well as some links. Now, one of the links that will be provided to you is to a shared box folder. Uh, some of you may have used Box in the past, Box.com. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Dropbox, one of the competitors, or SkyDrive, or OneDrive, or Google Drive, 100 different competitors. Uh, but Box is a, is a tool used here at Penn State, and what I have done is I've created a Box folder that contains all the documents you may possibly need over the course of your review. And it's all in one nice place, and I've shared, I created a shared URL. I will send that link to you, and it's password protected so that people can't just stumble on it. Uh, and I'll give you that password in the email. What I do ask of you is that you do not share that, this out. Uh, this isn't... Uh, this is not under lock and key. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for you to get to this information. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to, to spread it out uh, widely or publicly. So if you are uh, acting as a reviewer, we would ask that you do not share any of the documents or any of the proposals that you see with anyone who is not a fellow reviewer. Uh, if you happen to know some other reviewers and you want to commiserate, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but please do not share with anybody outside of the review committee. During or when you receive that email from me, it will have a link to that box folder. It will also have your review, assi review assignments. Each of you will be review or will be asked to review a total of four proposals. If you would like to do more, you are more than welcome to do more. I have actually had some reviewers who have done 10, 12, 15 reviews before. Uh, gluttons for punishment. But if, if you'd like to do more, that is great. But what is very important is that we remain mindful of any potential conflicts of interest. For those, those uh, reviews that you are assigned, we have already gone through and we have tried to identify any potential conflicts of interest. Uh, so if you do receive an assignment and you look at it and you think, I work for that person. Uh, one of the individuals on the team is your supervisor or your boss. 
uh, you were very close to them and you don't feel that you'd be able to give an unbiased review of their proposal, please contact me immediately, immediately and let me know. And what I'll do is I will switch out the reviews, I will ask someone else to take that review for you, and I'll switch out another one for, with you. And that way you can do your four, uh, just switching one of them out. And if you do any additional reviews, I ask that you also, again, remain mindful of those conflicts of interest and do not review any that you feel there may be. Now, for conflict of interest, that means not that you know that person's name, but essentially if it has any appearance of a conflict of interest, any appearance that you would not be able to give an unbiased review of that proposal, that's when we ask that you step aside. Uh, I have also gone through and... Uh, and ask those reviewers, I sent out emails this morning, ask those reviewers that were named individuals on proposals uh, to not participate in this round of reviews. Uh, so if either I missed you or you have not seen that email yet, uh, please check your email box and, and, and take a look. If your name is attached to any of the review or any of the proposals, I ask that you do not review this during this round. I'll bug you next round uh, to be a reviewer for us again. Uh, but again, because of conflicts of interest, uh, it's not necessarily fair uh, for someone who is on another proposal or has a, a, a stake in another one of the proposals to, to review others. So, with conflicts of interest out of the way, box. Uh, what you will receive is you will receive an email from me that has a link, and I'll actually just give you the link right now, um, although the folder is not quite ready yet. Uh, I'm still putting some things together and finalizing some documents. Uh, but the, the link that you will be receiving is box or psu.box.com slash coil rig. And when you go to that URL, what you will be prompted with is a, a password prompt. I will also send in that email uh, to you the password prompt or the password, which is as easy as um, coil rig, which should be easy to remember because it's part of the URL. Once you type in coil rig as the password, you will be presented with all of the documents related to the review process. Uh, Box does a strange thing where it sorts them by date rather than, but if you sort by name, you will see they are in order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as well as a folder that contains all of the proposals. Uh, and proposals are listed by a letter. When you receive your assignments, you will receive an, uh, uh, an email that says, uh, Karen, you will be reviewing proposal A, B, C, and D, which would mean you would come into this, this uh, folder, you would click on A, B, C, and D, and you can download each one of those. If you really would like to read them in your browser, you can also just click on the title of the, uh, of the PDF, and once it loads up, it will load up right in your browser window, and you can read it there. I would recommend uh, downloading them and having them locally uh, rather than having to try to work out of the box folder, but that's completely up to you. The download link is, is nice and simple to get to right here. You should be seeing my screen right now. So you will receive your, uh, your assignments for proposals, and you can, you can access all here. You will notice that there are some missing. There is no E here, and there are a few other missing, others missing as well. Uh, some of the proposals that were sent in did not uh, follow our rules for formatting and, uh, and page, page limits and word limits. Uh, so they have until 5 p.m. today to make those corrections and resubmit those, uh, those sections that are out of compliance. Once those are sent to us, then I will upload them here. Uh, so they may not be immediately available, but by tomorrow morning, uh, they should definitely be there. My plan is to get them uploaded by 10 after 5 today if they come in at 5 o'clock. Uh, so they should be available to you very soon after you receive the email with all of these links. Also within this folder are a number of different documents that I wrote out for you. Uh, what you'll do is once you get that email from me and it tells you, uh, Karen, you're reviewing A, B, C, and D, uh, you can come into here, download the proposals out of this proposal folder, print them off if you'd like, uh, look at them, <clears throat> make absolutely certain that they download and that they're readable. They should all be perfectly fine. Uh, I, I check them all. Uh, all the links that are in seem to work. And you do not have to worry about whether or not they, uh, they follow our, uh, our guidelines for formatting and our guidelines for uh, page limits and our guidelines for word limits. I already did that yesterday. Uh, so you don't have to concern yourself with any of that. What you're 
reviewing is the substance of each one of the proposals. Uh, so you don't have to worry about some of those more operational things. Those have been done for you. The first thing that, that you'll find, 01 here, is the actual RFP. Uh, this is the actual call for proposals that the uh, all proposers uh, saw and that they were responding to. Many times uh, our reviewers have found it useful to be able to look back and see the way we phrased things, what we included, uh, how it was written, and the formatting that we that we asked for. And they found that that helps them it helps to inform their their review. So it's there. Otherwise, you may not necessarily need it. All the really important information is included in some of these other documents. Uh, but you can access the PDF there. You can also, on the COIL website, if you go from grants and call for rig proposals, you will see the live RFP here. And this has all the information. This is exactly what all the proposers saw when they, when they created their proposals. But again, not that important for you, uh, more there for reference than anything else. This is probably the most important document, the reviewer instructions. If you click on the reviewer instructions, what you will see is uh, a lot of what you will also get in the email that I will be sending to you. In fact, I will be uh, attaching this document to the email that I send you. Uh, and this just walks you through uh, basically what is happening and, how, and what will happen over the next few days and what we ask you to do. Uh, I have a little bit of a statement about conflicts of interest there, just as I, uh, as I said to you. And then it tells you about the box folder. It gives you a link to the box folder. Again, this will be in the email as well. It gives you the password, coil rig, and asks you again not to share that outside of, outside of our group. Then, step by step, how to do what you need to do to conduct the reviews. Uh, first, go to the box folder. It has all the information you need. We ask you to score the four of the rigs that you have been signed. I state that you can do more if you'd like, as I mentioned. All the proposals are in the proposal folder. And there is also a rubric. So a scoring rubric titled Rig Review Rubric is in the box folder. Uh, so we will go ahead and take a look at that because this is where we're going to spend most of our time today is using this rubric and in fact I'm going to bring up a local copy so it's a little bit easier to see for you and that's about as big as I can get it so this is the rubric uh, that you will use for conducting your reviews in here, we have each one of the criteria that was stated to the proposers in the RFP. We have each one of the criteria, as well as a little bit of guidance for determining how you're going to assign points. In all the sections, it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But there are sections that are worth 10 points, for, innovation, for instance, innovation. In innovation, a, a proposer can receive up to 10 points for that section. So what we do is, rather than uh, attempting to have discern between 10 different levels of uh, innovation, or cases for innovation in the proposal, uh, which we know uh, through, through a, a fair amount of research, uh, that is very difficult for a human to do, uh, we give you five points uh, that you can work over, or just completely missing. But we give you five points of discernment, and then what we'll do is we multiply that by two. So in other words, if you give it a two, uh, the proposal's innovation may be inferred, but is not directly addressed and or sufficient evidence is provided. Give it a 2, it will actually give them a score of 4 out of that. Give them a 0, multiplied by 2, that's still 0. Uh, 3 times 2, 4 times 2, 5 times 2, uh, self-explanatory there. So this is the way it works for each one of these criteria. We also tried to give you a little bit of guidance as to what do we mean here by this criteria. So the first thing I'd do is I'd open up one of my proposals. I'd read the entire proposal front to back uh, unless there is a significant uh, supplementary material section. Uh, I should say that there are word and page limits for each section of the proposal. There are not limits on the supplementary materials. They are allowed to put in whatever they want including the kitchen sink. You are not in uh, required to read the supplemental material section. I would highly encourage you to do so if at all possible uh, because uh, at times it has a lot of good information in there, uh, particularly bios of the team 
that is going to be uh, conducting the research. Uh, so there will be great information in there. However, there are times when uh, we have had proposals come in with 20, 30 pages of supplemental materials, and you by no means need to feel obligated to read through all of that. Uh, you have to read the beginning sections, the five-page narrative, uh, the dissemination plan, the budget, and then glance through the supplementary materials as you'd like. But once I've read that entire proposal, I've looked through it, I've made some notes to myself as I've gone through, I would then pull out my rubric and I would think, okay, innovation. How did this score on innovation? What do I think about this proposal? The way we define innovation at COIL is we say it is the research, development, or introduction of something new or novel, whether it's an idea, a device, approach, something with the intent of improving learning. What we also want to know is whether or not that innovation has a potential for long-term impact. We're not that interested in a, an innovation that is a tempest in a teacup that's going to, to change one small operational detail that someone may have to deal with, but is not going to help others uh, in similar situations. We want something that is somewhat scalable and something that has a potential for longer-term impact. What innovation is not, by our definition, an innovation is not a refinement on an existing approach or a technology. It is not just a small incremental change. It has to be something big. Uh, it has to be a significant change or, uh, or alteration of that process, technology, or approach, uh, not, not uh, an incremental change. It also cannot be taking something that is well-worn and well-researched in, in some areas and applying it to a new context. Uh, I can give you some examples here. So something that would not be an innovation by our standard would be uh, someone who is taking a video conferencing technology. Uh, say, let's say Zoom US. Someone is proposing that they are going to use Zoom US for doing mentoring in, just-in-time mentoring in the medical fields. Uh, using video conferencing technology for just-in-time mentoring is well-tread and well-worn and well-researched in many different areas, education in particular. The application of that to a new context, medicine, would not, would not make it an innovation. That is an application of an existing approach in a new context. And so we, do not, we would not say that that is an innovation. What would be an innovation is a wholly new type of communication that would help support uh, some sort of just-in-time mentoring, uh, whether that be uh, the use of, uh, of, an augmented real of augmented reality glasses uh, for, for just-in-time mentoring feedback uh, that also uh, allows an individual, a, a remote mentor, to view what the, uh, what the uh, trainee is doing and to give them feedback in that moment. Uh, that would be an innovation. That would be something that hasn't been done much before, or at least not well. Uh, so that's, that has potential there. Uh, it's difficult to say exactly what an innovation is, because it's one of those where you know it when you see it. And so it's difficult for me to say, this is exactly what an innovation is, and this is exactly what an innovation is not. But what we hope is that these four points that I put underneath this innovation section helps to guide you toward your understanding of what an innovation is. Uh, in the rubric, in each one of these sections, we also try to tease out uh, the inclusion or the detail for each one of these. Uh, we do require, there is a 200 word section at the very front of each one of the proposals where the uh, proposer is required to say, state explicitly, what is the innovation here. Uh, so that should help you to tease out uh, that information a little bit and apply it directly to this section of the rubric. So that's the innovation section, uh, worth 10 points, uh, one, of the highest sec one of the highest scoring sections uh, in, in the rubric. Next is enhancing learning. As I said, we're laser focused on two things, innovations that impact learning. So the questions that we put underneath here, and I'm not going to read all these to you throughout the rubric because you, you can do that and you can, you can read through this whole thing. Uh, but to give you a sense is, does, can it change learning or teaching? 
uh, through the use of this innovation. Uh, and again, can it make that change on the long term beyond this one use case? Does it have the potential for a greater impact? As I said, these are seed funds. Uh, we're not looking for it to end as a seed. We're looking for it to grow into something uh, as, as time goes along. So what we're asking you to do here is to use your expertise and your knowledge to determine does this thing have legs? Can it go somewhere? Is it going to get bigger? Does it have a potential to really impact learning? Um, and that's that's what this section is. And again, we tease it out throughout here, uh, and you can read through those and use those as a bit of guidance. Uh, this is not intended to be hard and fast and limiting on you. Uh, this is intended to be a tool to help you. Uh, so if you feel this to be somewhat constraining, uh, feel free to to glance at it, look at it, and do your own review using your knowledge and expertise and experience. The third thing here is the alignment with COIL themes of personalization and student retention. Now all three of these sections so far, innovation, enhancing learning, and alignment with COIL themes are separate sections in the proposal, 200 word sections, where they have to tell you explicitly, or they have to explicitly address these three things. The alignment with COIL themes of personalization and student retention basically is COIL is really trying to focus our efforts on these two things. Now, these two things are pretty broad. Personalization is a broad area. Uh, student retention can be a very broad area open for a lot of interpretation, but, but that's okay. Um, but what we want to make sure is that these proposals, proposals are aligned in some way with those efforts that we have. Uh, will this thing that's been proposed Will it help personalize learning? Uh, will it help personalize the experience for the learner? Does it have the potential to retain students, both in their program, within a course, uh, within a university or an institution? Uh, can it help us with our retention goals that not just Penn State, every institute of higher education is struggling with this and, and is, is really focused on it? Uh, so can this proposal help in those areas? And then we give you some guidance, again, for how to tease that out. Uh, and you'll notice we're still in the 10-point range uh, here for, for each one of these. Now we move into some of the more operational uh, elements within the criteria. Is the R&D team well prepared to execute the project? Can they do what they say they're going to do? That's really the question. And where you're going to find a lot of that information is in that supplementary materials section, uh, where bios are included for each one of the team members, uh, sometimes they're going to give you a little bit of uh, background information on work that they've done in the past. Uh, that, that's where you're really going to find the answer to this. Uh, so this is where if you don't see it in the, in the main narrative section, take a look through that supplemental material uh, area and, and see if they, they make this case there. Uh, but basically, can they do what they're going to do? If they say, if it's a proposal that's all focused on building a software platform, but they don't have any software uh, developers on, on their team, uh, I would question whether they can execute the project. Uh, if it is something that is going to have students using it or faculty using it, and they have no one uh, assigned or budget uh, for a user experience designer or a user interface designer, that would concern me. Uh, and that's where perhaps I'd stay a little bit low on this scale uh, and not give them full points. Uh, but again, have to read through it, use your, your judgment to figure out where you think this lies. And we try to tease out all of the uh, various ways of, of looking at this section and, and assigning points. And you also notice this is the first five point section. Uh, so it's worth a little bit less than those uh, first three that we went through. Applicability, uh, can it work outside of the context that, that, they're, that they're conducting their experiment or their research in? Uh, can it impact someone beyond them, their course, or their particular instance. This is the scalability thing. Uh, not necessarily the practicality of that scalability, but the potential for. Can this be used somewhere else? Or is this really an idiosyncratic solution to an idiosyncratic problem? Yeah, uh, Adam, if you... Uh, why don't you just go ahead and, and type in the your question in the chat box? There we go. Are we expected to do any outside research to answer questions, everything exclusively in the proposal? No. In fact, I would, I would highly encourage you not 
uh, to bias yourself by going outside and looking at too terribly much more. Um, I'm, I can't stop you, uh, and I also cannot control what you may or may not already know based on connections that you have, uh, but by no means are you required to go out and do any supplemental research. It is the proposers, um, it is the requir requirement on them to make the case for their research in the five pages that they have. Um, so no, uh, please don't go outside and, and look for, for any more um, because that would uh, unfairly bias you toward that particular project or the availability of ex uh, additional information about that person. Uh, so, um, so applicability, this is that scalability issue, this is the potential for impact outside of this uh, use case uh, and that should be within the, within the main narrative. Cost effectiveness. Depending on your experience with budgets, uh, this may be or may not be a difficult one to answer, uh, but we do require them to give a full budget as well as a budget narrative to help to explain their budget to you. Uh, and, and basically the question to you here is, um, is this worth the money? Uh, it, it, do we get bang out of our buck here? Uh, are they reasonable for what we're going to get out of it? So if the potential for scaling a particular innovation is really low, uh, that it's bordering on that idiosyncratic solution to an idiosyncratic problem, but they're asking for $40,000, uh, that would give me pause. However, if it is a project that looks like it could have wide impact and it's $40,000 or $20,000 or, or, or anywhere, and it looks like it could have broad impact and it's worth the money, then this scales a little, this uh, this rates a little bit higher. So as you'll see in the rubric that we give you, uh, the highest point says it directly addresses the budget and cost effectiveness and gives really compelling in, uh, evidence that this that this is worth the money and that the money is being well spent. One of the changes that we have had in this round of rigs is that we used to have a maximum award of fifty thousand dollars that has changed to $40,000. And again, I've already gone through and looked at the proposals. They're all within range, so they're all okay there. Uh, but there has been a change. Most of the proposals, amazingly enough, are in the $39,990 range. Uh, it's amazing how that happens. Uh, but one of the big reasons for that is that one of the most common uses of funds in these research initiation grants is to hire a graduate assistant. Uh, because the the principal investigator essentially needs capacity. They need extra hands to help them. And a graduate assistant is a great way of doing that while also supporting the education of a student. So the graduate assistant position, once you get everything included and the fringe rates and everything else, it comes up in the $30,000 range. So you're going to see a lot of proposals in that range. And when you look at cost effectiveness, Personnel is expensive, uh, so you have to keep that in mind when looking at cost effectiveness and, and thinking through it. Uh, they can't do too terribly much ab about that. If a project needs a person, they need a person, and it's going to cost. Uh, however, if they are <clears throat> using their money to buy a bunch of laptops that they probably should already have available to them, uh, or they're buying some pieces of technology because it would be neat uh, and is not mission critical to their project, uh, that would be pretty low on the cost effectiveness. Uh, essentially, are they being good stewards of the money? And when it really boils down to it, that's the question for this criteria. Feasibility. They have 12 months to do this project. So the question for feasibility is, can they do it? Can they do it with the budget that they asked for? And can they do it in the time that they have allotted? They can't change the time. They have 12 months uh, to do the project. Again, they have 18 months of the money being available, but really the project has, has to be done with it in a 12-month period uh, because it takes time to move through the red tape, of closing budgets, opening budgets, and the like. Um, so when you're thinking through this, think, can, can they do it? Uh, we have had some uh, proposals that have come through that have promised the moon and the stars in 12 months. Uh, development of an entire software package as well as deploying it and researching uh, students' use of that software package. You're not going to be able to do that in 12 months. Uh, 
And if you have experience in software development or prototyping or anything like that, um, use that experience to really think through, do I think this can be done or, or are they shooting too high here and, and they're going to fall flat on their face? Uh, I would much rather uh, an individual be conservative in what they think they're going to do and then provide us with some potential if they have the time uh, to, to do extra than to promise far too much and fail to deliver. Uh, we, we will not add time to these proposals. They cannot come back to us and say, we need six more months. Uh, this, the money is available when the money is available, and that's it, even if they aren't able to spend it. So one of the other practical concerns to think about while, while looking at this is uh, wrangling people. Uh, very often, uh, setting up research projects where you're bringing in a lot of students it takes time. It takes time to go through the IRB, Institutional Review Board, to get approval to do this. It takes time to coordinate schedules. Uh, and you have to look at their timeline that they include in the proposal and think, you know, is this reasonable? Uh, and if it's not, give feedback. So one of the greatest things that comes out of this rig process uh, is for the proposals. The proposers get your feedback, not just your feedback, but the feedback of you and, and nine others that go through and on each one of these criteria give a rating and then also give comments and, and substantive feedback. We're only going to fund three or four of these 30 proposals that came in. So that means the vast majority of them are going to have to move on to other pastures or find other sources of funding. What you can do for them is you can help them get off on the right foot for the next grant process by helping, really think, helping them really think critically through what they wrote and what they're proposing to do. And so they can take that feedback, implement it into their proposal, and then go on for that next grant. An interesting number is that 75%, 75% of those proposals that have come through our rig process more than once have been accepted. So that means 75% of those who go through this rig process get that feedback and fail to get funding, but then incorporate that feedback, come back in the next round and submit, get, get funded. Um, so your feedback is critical to them because they're not just coming back to us, they're going to other grant agencies as well. And, and you can help that project move on even if they don't get rig funding. Uh, so feasibility, going through that. Research evaluation plan, this is another 10-point section. Uh, this is basically, do they have a plan? Uh, do they have a plan for developing whatever they're going to develop? Do they have research questions? Are they good research questions? Um, and, and you just need to read through uh, what they're planning on doing, how they frame their research or evaluation of what they're doing, and, and determine what the point value might be here. And again, we, we give you some guidance. Um, these are research initiation grants. Now that said, we're also doing development uh, through these. But there has to be some sort of component of research, whether that be an evaluation of the development of whatever they're building, uh, or some sort of use that they are then getting some or collecting some data around. Uh, there has to be some element there of research. And it is explicitly stated in the RFP that there have to be research or evaluate research questions or an evaluation plan. Uh, so look through it, see if they're there, and then use this rubric to help determine whether or not they, they met that criteria. Like or potential to generate subsequent research funding. This is that seed idea. So yeah, it's it's great, you've got a great idea. Um, is anyone else going to be interested in this? Are you going to be able to get other funding? And one of the things that we have in the RFP is that we ask the proposers to state, where are you going to go next? What's down the road? Is it Gates? Is it IES? Is it, uh, is, is it um, any other type of funding agency out there that is going to bring some money to the table to help you with your project? Or it could be something internal. Uh, very often, teaching and learning with technology here at TLT group here at Penn State helps to move some of our projects along after the 12 months is up. So if the proposer comes in and says, we're going to use this funding to build this baseline tool, and depending on the success of this tool, the teaching and learning with technology has committed to help us with further development. Or, or even just saying, we will bring it to TLT and ask them to help us with further development. Just having a plan. 
so that we know that they know what they're going to be doing in the future. Uh, so we ask you to help rate that project on its potential uh, for sub research. Uh, and, and very often I have seen proposers who are on the five uh, point scale of this uh, who say this is the grant we will be going for. And they, they explicitly say this one is in alignment with what we're doing. Once we've uh, conducted some of this pilot research using, using the coil rig funding, we will be going for this, this bigger pot of money. Uh, so, so that is great. If they leave it uh, more broad and uh, more general or don't address it at all, then it will be lower here on the scale. And finally, dissemination plan. This is a one-page section, uh, usually at the very end. I believe almost all the proposers had it at the very end. And this is, how are you going to let other people know about your project? Um, how are you going to get the word out? What I would love to see, but it wasn't required, but I, what I would love to see is them uh, leveraging some of COIL's resources uh, for that, saying in their proposal that they will do a COIL conversation or approach us about doing a COIL conversation, um, or that they are going to, you know, to, to go to a few conferences, maybe the TLT symposium that we hold every, every March. Um, some sort of statement of how they're going to get word out about their project, both during and after its completion. Uh, this does not have to be one of those that's that's uh, that's limited within the 12 months. They could say it's going to take us 12 months to get the data, and then uh, 20 months from now or 24 months from the start of the project, we will be presenting at uh, this OLC conference or or whatever it may be. Uh, but some sort of plan for getting the information out about there. Now you will notice that this is a little bit different. You got a couple grayed out boxes here. That is because this is the only three-point section uh, or criteria we have uh, in this rubric. So you can either score it as a zero, uh, a, a zero, a one, let's see up here, a one, two, or three. And, and this essentially is, is the maximum that you can give for it. And when you go into the tool, and I'll show you the tool in a section, in a second, uh, you'll see how the slider works for giving that. But that's the maximum that you can give. This, this is the highest that you could possibly give. Uh, this is the you know middle, low, and then nothing's even been included. So that's a rubric. Uh, if you have any questions about the rubric, go ahead and, and type into the chat box. But you have this available to you in the box folder, um, which you'll see here. Get out of it here. It's the third item here. Now, the rubric is great. But sometimes you want to be able to be thinking through these things as you actually um, as you actually do your review or as you actually read the proposal, and that's what this fourth thing is. This is the review worksheet. Uh, this is basically a word document. You can print this out. You can write the name of the PI on it for the proposal proposal you're about to read, and then you can jot down your scores and your things as you go along. Uh, same prompts, same information. A box where you can put in, you know, did it get 10? Did it get how many points did it get? And then write in, in your comments. And then you can go to the online form and you can type it into the online form. This worksheet is completely up to you whether or not you use it. We will not collect it. We don't want it. Uh, this is not how you will be submitting your reviews. In the past, we have just had a number of reviewers ask us for this resource. So we put it together for you. It's there if you'd like to use it. If you don't, you can completely and totally ignore this and do your, your reviews directly in the survey tool, which we will get to almost next. Here, number five, this basically walks you through what I just walked you through and tells you how to uh, do what we're about to do. Essentially, this is just a narrative form of what I'm about to show you. Uh, so we're not going to go through that because I'm going to show you directly. Um, there is a link to the review proposals uh, here. You can download this, and once it's on your desktop, all you have to do is click on it, uh, and it will bring you directly to that, uh, to that form. It is also hyperlinked in almost all the documents that I send. So we will go ahead and open that up, and we'll take a look. So this is the actual survey tool. If you want to do your reviews live in this tool rather than using the worksheet, that's perfectly fine. It will save your responses as you go along so that if you have to stop in the middle, you don't lose your information. Uh, but it's, it's right here. The password, and you will see here, it tells you, has coil rig. So I will type that in here. 
And that brings me, oops, I always forget, the enter key doesn't actually move you forward. You have to click on the button there. This will move you to here. So you should see your name somewhere in this list. Uh, this has all of our current reviewers. I will select myself down at the end here. And then next, and please, I, I implore you, I beg of you, please be very careful with this section. Click on the proposal you are reviewing. Um, if you make an error here, it is sometimes challenging for me to catch it. Uh, usually I do. Um, I read through all the comments, and if I see something that just doesn't seem right, uh, I can then work out uh, um, which proposal you were talking about. But I beg you, take your time here and make sure you check the correct box for the proposal you are reviewing. Uh, it make things, makes things much, much easier on me, uh, and it makes certain that we give the most accurate responses. For now, I'm going to pick the test, and you can do this as well if you just want to run through this, proposal, this uh, survey tool at some point. You can click on this and do a test. We click forward, and it will move us to the questions. You should recognize this by now. Innovation, 10 points. Here's the way we frame it out, and then we have the option, what, what is your score that you're giving? So let's say I'm going to give it a 9, and I give some very nice feedback, and I encourage you, please, give feedback, give comments on, on, on every section, every criteria. Uh, the, proposal, the proposers, the PIs, will be grateful, deeply, deeply grateful uh, for that, particularly particularly if you're going to give them a very high or a very low score. Um, if you rate someone with a 1 in that innovation section, please do not uh, leave the comment section blank uh, because that makes us question that score. Yeah, so uh, so the one through f the zero through five times two. This I, I haven't actually finished this section yet. Um, so it will be once you get to it, it will be one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I apologize for that. Again, this isn't going to be sent out to you until five p.m. today, um, but it will be directly reflect what's in that uh, what's in that rubric. Uh, so you'll see one, two, three, or I'm sorry, you'll you'll see one, two, three, four, five, and it will score it on. Uh, two times uh, for that. It will multiply by two for us on our end. Uh, so once you go through, and I think some of these have been fixed for that, but we haven't finished up yet. Uh, we had to enter all of the uh, information. The proposals proposals just came in at 5 p.m. last night, uh, so we were actually up to almost 3 o'clock this morning trying to get all this done for you guys. Uh, we missed the mark a little bit. But anyway, uh, once you give the, the point value, you type in your comment, you will move on to the uh, next section. And you'll see enhancing learning, same thing. You will give it its point value, you give it a nice comment, and you will move through. And you'll see this one has already been aligned, so it's uh, with five points. So we go through, and we will score each one of these sections. And the reason I'm moving through all this is to show you something at the very end. All these match the, both the rubric and the worksheet perfectly. Moving through. Giving a couple low. Yeah, you're telling me, Angela. Uh, we we try to do this process as quickly as we possibly can to give uh, feedback and get funding in hands as fast as possible. Um, there are very few grant processes that have turnaround time from proposal being due to money in hands of uh, of essentially a month, and that's with uh, two holidays included in there. Uh, so money is ha is in hands and ready to be spent before January 1st. Uh, so we, we, we move as fast as we can on this while still giving you a su sufficient time to conduct your reviews uh, and giving us enough time to, to do this right. So you just saw me kind of move through the entire uh, review process here in the survey. This is what I wanted to point out. You get to the very end here and you will notice it says you are almost done. Please be certain to click on the right arrow button to finish your review. If you do not click this button to uh, move the forward to that final screen, it will remain as a draft, uh, in, and it will not be uh, easily available to me uh, to get your scores. Uh, so please, once you complete it, 
you get to that screen, click it, and you will finally see this. We thank you for your time spent taking this survey. Your response has been recorded. So that is now official, it's in there, and it's done. If there are any problems, you go through and you get done with a review and you look at it and you think, oh, I just completely messed up. I transposed which survey it was or which proposal it was or, or some sort of error, email me. Email me or call me. I'll go in and I will help you fix it uh, and we'll get it all taken care of. No concerns. There is no way after a, after a survey has been submitted, there is no way for you to go back and change anything. Uh, but I can do that for you. Uh, so you just let me know. That's the uh, that's the actual survey tool, and you'll see here that's the link that you can use to get to it, as well as all the hyperlinks in these documents. And then finally, how will your data be used? We just put this in here to 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 ease your mind a little bit. This is as anonymous of a process as we can possibly make it. There's only one person that will know who uh, did which review, and that is me. Um, no one else uh, has it. It's all hidden. Uh, no one else will even see the reviewer assignments, so no one will know who is reviewing what. Um, it will uh, once the uh, the overview of reviews is sent out, your name will be anonymized, uh, so you will simply be a number, and and no one will be able to track that back to you. And and hopefully this gives you peace of mind where if you are reviewing a proposal uh, where there's no conflict of interest, but you still know the person. Uh, and, and you wouldn't want it to get out uh, what some of your comments were because uh, we we do the proposers a service. We do the proposers a service by being blunt and honest with them. Uh, so to allow you to feel free to do that, all that will be will, will remain anonymous. When it comes time for the uh, for the reviewer meeting, and I mentioned that in a few of the emails I've sent out that we'll be having this reviewer meeting. And during that reviewer meeting on the 7th, we will be discussing the top 10 proposals. Uh, there's no need to bring everyone in from all 30 proposals. If it was rated as a 25th proposal out of 30, it is not likely going to be funded. Uh, I will just say it's not going to be funded. Uh, so there's no reason to waste your time being there to discuss it. Uh, but if you're in the top, if you review a proposal in the top 10, we ask that you be there, either virtually or in person. And during that, <clears throat> we will ask a chief advocate, uh, those chief advocates will be assigned uh, for each proposal. We'll ask that chief advocate to just kind of give an overview of what that proposal is, and then we will open the floor for anyone to comment about that proposal. Uh, so if you did a review on one of those top 10 proposals, and we sit down and you want to talk about it, then you can you can bring up your uh, feedback on that proposal, but you never have to identify yourself as one of the reviewers. Again, all the proposals are open to everybody, so you could read proposals without being a reviewer on it. Uh, in fact, a lot of people like to do that. Uh, this is a great way of putting your finger on the pulse of the innovative work being done across the university. Uh, right now, we have 30 innovative ideas sitting in front of us, uh, and it, it really gives us a sense of what's going on. So. That's the process, uh, beginning to end. Uh, all the documents are in this box folder, uh, which I hope will be nice and easy for you to access and to, uh, to go through the documents. The narratives and step-by-step -step instructions are embedded both in these reviewer instructor instructions and how to conduct and submit reviews. Uh, that can walk you through the process, but it's basically what I just did. Uh, so I'll give some time for questions. And while I'm giving that time for questions, I'm going to give one, I'm going to say one more thing. I'm going to give you an opportunity to type in the box if you have anything. Um, and it is that this review process or this entire grant process is open to everyone uh, at in the Penn State community. So faculty, staff, undergrad students, graduate students. Uh, if it's someone who's a, who's directly affiliated with Penn State, they can submit you are going to see a broad range of ideas and quality of submissions. Uh, so you will see, you will have some submissions that have been submitted by individuals who are currently leading multi-multi-million dollar NSF grants. You will also see submissions from uh, some individuals who have never submitted a grant before in their life. I'm a teacher. 
I will always be a teacher. It doesn't matter what position I ever hold, I will always be a teacher. And one of the things that, that we do, or the, the responsibility we have, is to help all of these individuals, no matter where they're coming from, no matter what their experience is, to help all of these proposers develop their idea and to present it in the best way possible, to help them refine their proposal. So I encourage you, if you are reading any of these proposals, and you know it's not going to be funded, you know it's, it's, it's just not quite there yet, it's a three-quarters baked idea, to use those comment sections as an opportunity to help that individual to refine their proposal and make it better uh, for the next time around. Uh, we have our highest rated proposal last, last round. Uh, and highest by a mile. It almost had a perfect score. Uh, and if you can think eight reviewers uh, that round uh, on all these criteria and was an almost perfect score, that individual was a student who had submitted three times. That first time was in the bottom three proposals. But the feedback, the comments, the support that they received, that this individual received from the review committee helped them build a better proposal. And their idea is a great idea that has, that has great potential for, for funding coming in, large-scale funding coming into this university. Uh, so I, I just wanted to take this moment to encourage you to think about that when you're conducting these reviews. I do not mean to use a, a sliding scale on reviews. We have criteria. This is a criterion-based review. Use that rubric. But help to support them in the comments. Uh, by giving them some, some, some sort of feedback to help improve what they're submitting. So, yes, Adam, uh, the, essentially the timeline is that uh, as of uh, 5 o'clock today or first thing in the morning, my, my deadline for myself is 10 a.m. tomorrow, and that's what I said publicly. Uh, but hopefully shortly after 5 today, you will have access to all of this material. The proposal, or I'm sorry, the reviews are then due back to me, uh, or due within that system, uh, by Wednesday per second, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the end of the day, um, that Wednesday, I will ask that all of your reviews be in the survey tool, that they are completed and done. I will then essentially overnight compile that information, run some standard analytics on it, and then send that back to you in order to have everything ready for the next Monday when we have our meeting. Uh, so you've got a little over, to, uh, or just about two weeks uh, to conduct the reviews, four reviews, and they're basically six page proposals. Uh, so you can, you can paste that out as best you can. Are there any questions, uh, concerns? I don't see anybody typing in the box, so I'm going to assume not. The last thing I will say, well, two of the last things. I always have a lot of last things. Two last things I'll say. Uh, number one is that if you need anything, call me, email me. Uh, I will put my information in here right now uh, so that you can access me. Uh, sorry. Uh, there's my email, and here is my phone number. Uh, I am available from 7 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night. Uh, that's the availability I make, I make for myself during this rig process. If you have a question, if you have a problem, if you have a concern, contact me either through, through either one of those, and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, you are doing a great thing for us, and we will try to be as helpful as possible. The second thing I'll say, and the last thing I'll say, I promise, is thank you. Um, I, I, I mean that sincerely. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your effort. I appreciate your expertise that you're bringing to the table and you help make some great ideas uh, come to fruition. Uh, not just for individuals, not just for programs or departments or even this university, uh, but for higher education and learning in general. Uh, your time and your effort is really helping to advance that cause. So I thank you for that. So I promise that was the last thing. I uh, appreciate you being here today. Uh, we will also do a uh, posting of a recording of this. I'll email that out to you uh, in, in the next few hours. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.